This weekend, we'll see the launch of Naughty Dog's first release in the PlayStation 5, The Last of Us Part 1, which in the interest of full disclosure, I got to play early because I was provided a review copy by Sony a couple days before launch. With that established, The Last of Us Part 1 is a from-the-ground-up remake of Naughty Dog's iconic 2013 PS3 game, The Last of Us, redone to take advantage of the PS5's hardware and features, modernizing one of the most beloved games of all time. The original game is one of the first things that comes to my mind when I master my favorite game of all time is, having played it four times since I got it via its remaster on PS4 when that came out in 2014. And with each and every playthrough, I was just as engrossed and moved by it as I was the first time. So when I first heard that the game was going to be remade just nine years after its debut, I was confused more than anything else. For my full thoughts on this game's announcement, I did a video on it alongside the announcement of Resident Evil 4 Remake that you can check out. But the TLDR was that I came to the conclusion that no game needs to justify its own existence to me in a philosophical manner, and what games deserve to be remade is arbitrary and highly subjective. Plus, what a remake even is in the gaming sphere is also debatable. If the talented people at Naughty Dog felt something interesting could be added to this game by updating it on PS5, I'm more than willing to hear them out. After spending a few days playing it through one more time, how did I feel regarding The Last of Us Part 1? What does it do differently, and is it worth the asking price? All that is what I set out to discover by playing this game, and that's what I shall answer before the video is over. I'm not going to give my thoughts on the game as an experience, since I already went over that in an older video that will suffice for anyone curious as to what I like about the story and characters so much. This video assumes that you already know the gist of the game and are specifically curious about what's new in the PS5 version of the game. So with that said, let's dive into it. One of the most highly touted features Naughty Dog pulled off in The Last of Us Part 2 from 2020 was its expansive accessibility options for players with different conditions, making it so the barrier to entry was non-existent, and all that has been worked into The Last of Us Part 1. Creating a full mode specifically designed for blind players or players with low vision to be able to play and understand what's going on with every cutscene, having the option for detailed narration, describing what's going on like you were listening to an audiobook. And there are settings for deaf players and those hard of hearing as well. For me personally, while I can hear everything perfectly, I have a hard time discerning and focusing on different sounds that are going on at once, so when I was messing around with the options menu, I thought the ability to see which direction a line of dialogue was coming from was an interesting feature that I had turned on for the entire game. The original game had subtitles, but being able to fully customize the size, the background, whether or not characters' names were listed or not were all welcome features. The experience is fully customizable, including players being able to choose the button mapping of every feature in the game, which is always great for when you think R1 might be a better choice for sprinting than L1, for example. In terms of visuals, you can customize your experience there, too, by picking between Fidelity Mode, which sets the resolution at 4K but goes down to 40 frames per second, and Performance Mode, which drops the resolution down to 1440p but keeps the frame rate targeted at 60fps. As someone who will always prefer frame rates, I stuck with Performance Mode throughout the entire game, like I also do in every other PS5 game that provides the option. Even down to the smaller stuff, you can still configure it, like the Motion Blur slider and the Film Grain slider. So I hope you get the picture, it's a fully customizable experience. When looking at the gameplay, the raw experience is pretty much the exact same as it was on PS3 and PS4. The goal is still to explore areas collecting items you can use to enhance your weapons, while you either choose to kill the hordes of enemies and infected that come your way or sneak past them, while listening to a boatload of dialogue that develops the characters. It's a Last of Us game, needless to say. But there are some changes. The enemy AI is far smarter than the previous version, being programmed to know where your last known location was so enemies will go around and try to get the drop on you from behind. Even though I played the game on normal difficulty, I died a lot more than I remembered on previous versions when battling the human enemies for this very reason. The AI on your partner characters has also been reworked to be smarter, following pathways that don't see them running into the line of fire of enemies nearly as often. Another subtle improvement added from The Last of Us 2. But what many players might be disappointed with is the fact that playing as Joel hasn't changed between the original versions and the new one. Many fans had hoped we'd get some mechanics from The Last of Us Part 2, like crawling along the ground to avoid detection being put into Part 1. But this is not the case, unfortunately. I don't see why they couldn't have done it. The level design is the same as the original, so in theory it might break it to have more abilities than these areas were designed for, but if enemies are going to be smarter, I think it would only make the game more balanced to have a dodge move when you're getting crowded by enemies. The new game also offers original modes not seen in the original release, like the new permadeath mode, which makes it so that dying sets you back to the start of the current chapter, really upping the stakes of the game for those who want the ultimate challenge, since you can activate this alongside grounded mode, the hardest and most aggressive mode the original game had. There's also speedrun mode, which times you based on how quickly you can get through the game. Speedrunning is a big community for almost every game, so seeing developers fully embrace that portion of their audience is always nice. And once you beat the game, you can also access skins, like giving Ellie a Sly Cooper t-shirt. This had to be said because it's Sly Cooper, and it's been a few videos since I last went out of my way to mention or make reference to Sly Cooper, the best franchise in all of gaming, don't at me. 
The game makes full use of the PS5's DualSense controller in all the ways you'd expect, like using the haptic feedback to vibrate alongside different conditions like the rain hitting the characters or Joel swimming in the water, or using the adaptive triggers to apply different levels of resistance when aiming weapons like the bow and arrow or the shotgun, and it, like it always does in PS5 games, feels fantastic to play. The PS5's SSD is also put to excellent use by making the load screens almost non-existent, which is a definite improvement over the PS4 version and especially the PS3 original while also upping the graphical load by a considerable amount. The Last of Us Part 1 looks utterly stunning, even though I was just playing at 1440p. The lighting is phenomenal, enhancing the atmosphere with different lighting conditions, creating lifelike textures for clothes and hair being hit by rain, and making everything as detailed as possible, including the grass on the ground, the buildings both nearby and in the distance, as well as the concrete you walk on. The Last of Us Part 1 is pretty cutting edge when it comes to the visuals. When you look back at the game how it was originally seen, you just have to stop and think, Damn, did it really look like that? Because once you've played the game on PS5, you just see how far the visuals have come in just 9 years, when those PS3 graphics were the cream of the crop in 2013. Although, while I'm talking about visuals, it should be mentioned that I did see some issues I've never run into before on PS4, such as infected models disappearing while they killed me, which I saw twice in my playthrough and never have before. There was also this flickering in the top left of the screen when I first entered the hotel area. I played the game in the most recent patch, and I'm sure more patches will come post-launch to iron out little things like that, because otherwise my experience was pretty rock solid. The biggest win The Last of Us Part 1 gets out of the presentation will be the cutscenes. Starting with the first Uncharted on PS3, Naughty Dog has been using motion capture for the cutscenes of their games. However, starting with Uncharted 4 in 2016, they added facial capture. This enhanced all the scenes because of the fact that players got to not only see the body language of the actors doing their scenes, but also see the facial expressions in each line, which of course The Last of Us Part 2 also had. The Last of Us 1 was made back when they didn't use facial capture, but the team went back and closely studied the facial expressions of the actors in the motion capture performance in order to create matches for those in the new cutscenes. This sounds really minor, but it adds so much to a story we're all familiar with. It's the exact same dialogue and performances from 9 years ago, just now with this extra humanizing element where we see all the little details we didn't before, like characters widening their eyes or squinting their eyes for emphasis, moving their eyebrows up and down, or quivering lips, and the list goes on. With the characters feeling more human in their faces, it makes an already emotional story even more so. Even the way the shots are composed is slightly different from the original, so I can't even imagine how much work went into these cutscenes alone, but it was all for the better. And as told by the developers on social media, they achieved it all without crunching for time. A major win in ensuring our favorite games are made in healthy environments for the people who work on them. Crunch is just one of those terrible things in the industry we seemingly got used to in regards to how games were made, and I'm glad there's been a pushback on that status quo in recent years. So, now that that all has been said, you know what's in The Last of Us Part 1, but should you pick it up? Well, that's where it gets more complicated. Without question, this is the best version of The Last of Us to ever exist. In terms of graphics, gameplay, cutscenes, immersion, it's better and is more detailed than the original in almost every respect. It took a game I would call perfect and made it even more so. It truly perfected perfection, but they're asking full price for it. On a console that's backwards compatible with PS4 games, including The Last of Us Remastered, which is dirt cheap these days. Can I recommend you buying the game for that full price? Well, if you're a massive fan of The Last of Us, I say why the heck not? I mean, for me, as a massive fan of the original, I thought this was a superb new version of it that makes the originals obsolete. But $70 isn't nothing at the same time on a console that is still limited in availability across the globe, no less. If you're a hardcore fan with the cash to spend, I'd say go for it in a heartbeat. But if you want to wait for a price drop or a sale, I say that's the safest bet for both you and for people who maybe aren't diehard fans like me, or just want to play the game again or for the first time. That's the sad thing though, I'm not saying there isn't $70 worth of work here, because these accessibility features and DualSense integrations and AI overhauling and visuals and the cutscene reanimation no doubt took a lot of time and effort. $70 worth of effort, if you ask me. But the gameplay mechanics are the same as the original, so for a large portion of the audience, that's all they're going to care about. If they just added some of the mechanics from The Last of Us 2 like I mentioned, I genuinely think this game's value would be crystal clear, since that would impact the play experience of a lot of people. But as it stands, it just isn't that way. So therefore, the $70 seems a lot steeper than it is, in my opinion. Which I do think is a valid thought, which is why I say wait for a sale if you're on the fence. But just know that I thought it was fantastic, personally, and I'm gonna pick up a physical copy of it as soon as it comes out. It's especially going to be worthwhile once it releases on PC, a platform The Last of Us has never been on, giving an audience of people who may have never played the game before access to the best version, which is great. I am for sure going to pick it up on Steam when it comes out there, since I play most of my games on PC these days. And while this next bit is an abrupt topic transition, 
I just figured I'd bring up something I thought about when reflecting on my overall positive experience with the game. Another thing I was thinking about when considering The Last of Us Part 1 as a package is more of an industry-wide anecdote. While the visuals in this game are stunning, putting the previous version to shame, it does make you wonder when exactly we as a gaming collective will decide that graphics are good enough. I still think the original looks great given the standards of the time it was released, it just isn't the most up-to-date compared to what the PS5 can do. The PS5 upgrade being quite definitive. But who's to say that PS7 and 2032 won't be a major leap as well, making it possible for the game to be even more immersive then? So do we keep remaking it every 10 years? While I thought the game was great overall, if it was up to me, the priorities of the industry would be focusing on new games, but also making sure gaming's legacy content was easily accessible with the highest resolutions and frame rates. That, I think, will be for the best, since a lot of games aren't going to get the treatment this game got, instead just being given some janky-ass remaster that was rushed out the door, or just being left behind. Forcing fans of those titles to hold on to old consoles where they probably don't even run that well. Which is the case for most 7th Gen games, for example. Maybe this isn't super realistic, but I'm just saying it's the trend that I hope the industry goes in going forward. Now with that said, I have nothing more to add on the subject of this game for now. I thought the remake was great, and will be how I return to this game whenever I feel the need to do so, which will absolutely happen numerous times in the future. And I look forward to whatever Naughty Dog puts out next. I just wanted to make it clear that I loved this game and thought the effort that went into it was astonishing, but that I get why someone wouldn't make it a day one buy and wait for a sale. And I just wanted to use the end of this video as a chance to briefly mention my thoughts on the whole remake trend we've seen in games recently. So I hope my several different points are clear, since that's all the time we got for today. So next week will be the Lost World 3DS video, so I hope you're all looking forward to that. And in the meantime, I'll say what I always do. Thanks everyone for watching, and I'll see you next time.